Welcome to day five of your 30-day dental MBA on how to become a customer-focused dental office. I got to congratulate you guys for hanging in there with me uh, to day five. Uh, let's keep rocking and rolling. We got so much to learn, so little time to do it. Basically, if you're going to become a consumer-focused dental office, you got to dump all this culture, tradition, customs, biases, prejudices, heuristics that came loaded with a dental degree, a medical degree, a law degree, this, uh, this internal breeding about sovereign professional stuff, and start looking at the customer. The customer's not coming in there saying, I'm looking for someone in a medical dental building with a fountain. They're saying, I want availability. I want accessibility. I want tooth colored feelings. I want service. I want to go where someone knows my name, the end of the cheer song. Um, you, you need to go retail. Many, many dentists, when I opened up in 87, when I opened up out there in a Safeway Plaza, they, they'd all say to me snidely, well, would you go to a doctor that was in a Safeway Plaza? And it's like, well, buddy, I get uh, um, 2,000 new patients a year and you get uh, 20 new patients a month, and you're telling me about what you would do, you aren't the market. What percent of your customers are doctors or dentists or physicians? Hell, I got physicians, chiropractors, orthopedic surgeons. You know why my orthopedic surgeons come to me? Heck, I'm the only one open seven to seven Monday through Thursday, seven to four on Friday, and nine to three on Saturday. Those guys work 60, 70 hours a week. They need consumerism more than you do. Look at the physicians I use. My number one primary care physician is an emergency room. Hell, I, uh, if it's broken, it needs to be fixed, and it's 2 o'clock in the morning, I'd rather go get it done in an emergency room once every two or three years than wait for a physician to get me in during the day. You want another opinion? I'll give you one. You're an idiot. That's my favorite cartoon. That's, that's the professional, dogmatic, force-fed relationship that doctors, dentists, and lawyers, and nurses, and RNs, and uh, registered dental hygienists are taught. It's like they dogmatically, religiously know it all, and they try to force feed the market. The first law of customer service is satisfaction equals perceptions minus expectations. Perceptions is what I perceive as happening minus what I thought was going to happen. The second law of customer service is it's hard to play catch up ball once you are behind. So basically, you know, I always, you know, when people talk about reading the market, to you, it's Mrs. Market. Uh, 764 million healthcare appointments made, 89% of them are made by women. Let me tell you something. In this industry, in medicine, in hospitals, in primary care, gynecology, whatever, if it's healthcare, you better have both eyes on mom. And I'll tell you what, you got a family come in and dad goes home and says, you know, I, I, I didn't like Dr. Fran, I'm not going back there. She says, shut up and go to your chair. He takes her insurance, the kids like him, yada, 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 yada. Mom inside the hut, mom's the power source, she's the power center, she gets the kids during the divorce, she'll kick your butt out and, uh, and it'll be hard to get back in. She's the eye on the ball. For instance, when I do an exam, and it's dad, I go in there and I examine his teeth and you know, during a cleaning, whatever, ask me if any problems, whatever, go. If it's Billy or Janie or the kids or whatever, same thing, go do the exam or whatever. But when I sit there and do the children, I always sit there in the hygienist. The hygienist knows I'm going to say, is mom out there in the waiting room? Uh, is mom, you know, it's in economics. We make decisions based on how we see the score and incentive rewards, okay? Well, mom's a decision maker. I'm going in there. I don't care if it's a three-year-old kid or an 18-year-old kid. If this is still living in the house of the mom, I know mom's a decision maker. She made the appointment. She's paying the bill. So I sure as hell don't want her in the waiting room. I, the hygienist know when I walk in there, go out there and get mom. I'm not going to ask a 16-year-old kid if everything's okay and does he have any questions. Hell, he's laying there with a burger hanging out of his nose, an earring with big old wide pants. This guy doesn't know uh, what's going on. I need his mom in there. And then I'll sit there and the mom. So mom, everything's going all right? And she'll let out little slips where if I wouldn't have done that, things have gone wrong. Like when she says things like, well, Dr. Fran, um, last time I was in here six months ago, I asked if Billy's going to need braces. And you said that you would kind of see how it goes and you'd let me know by summer. And this is the summer appointment. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, yeah, you're right. Oh, yeah, exactly, sure. And then if I would have left her in the waiting home, you know, and, and moms are weird because 24 out of 25 moms with a complaint, they just exercise their complaint with their feet. They just don't come back. And that's why, you know, if you want to understand women controlled markets, the old saying is, when the phone doesn't ring, you'll know it's me, okay? 
All they do is they vote with their feet, they pack it up and go somewhere else. They don't like confrontational tolerance, especially with some alpha bull male. Uh, they just, they just soon, you know, they're frustrated, they're upset, they just go somewhere else, okay? It's kind of like when your wife comes home, you know, she's upset, and you say, honey, is something wrong? And she says, uh, no one storms out of the room. Okay, that, that means yes, and you better go follow her, and you better find out what the hell went wrong. And when the phone don't ring, you know it's me, and you got to get mom in there. And so many times, something will go wrong, and she's driving home, and she's sitting there saying, well, you know, I wonder why he didn't do this, or he didn't do that, or he doesn't do this. Get mom in there, figure out her attitudes, her choices, her preference, her values, her needs, her wants, and get this qualitative stuff on the chart. When your chart comes in there, dentists are always asking, you know, they ask every stupid medical health issue question about, you know, and, and you go to some of these institutes and they teach you to do these four-hour new patient exams and palpate them until people call the police and ask them 4,000 medical questions. And, if, I mean, it gets so stupid. I mean, they start asking them, um, now, like, um, when you poop, does it uh, float or sink? See, if your poop floats, it's high in fat. If it sinks, it's low in fat. Now, if it stays together in a ball, there's no fiber. If it flushes out, it's fiber. Have you ever seen a cow crap in a pond? That's how your turds look. Just right to the bottom sinks. If you're, if you're flushing the toilet and you've got little balls that float, no fiber, no fat. I mean, people don't care about that stuff. Ask them. Look, you're 35 years old, and, and, and you're walking to my office for the first time. Did you just move to Phoenix? If they say, no, I've lived here five years, say, well, then have you gone to this last five years? They say, well, yeah. Okay. Why are you here or not there? I don't need to know their name. Don't, we're not talking about gossip, but tell me, why did you not go back there? And, and I'll tell you what, if you don't have a front office staff, a hygienist or an assistant that can extract all that information before you walk in the room, um, then you, do, you don't have a team because she is nine times more likely to tell your receptionist, your hygienist, your dental assistant what went wrong. Because when you walk in there, here's an alpha bull male. She thinks you probably golf with this guy. She might go to the, the Lutheran church and he's in the same church and she just doesn't want confrontational tolerance. Just forget it. Well, I don't want to forget it. I need to know why you went to a dentist for five years and then go back. I get assistance. I hire assistants and receptionists based on only one criteria. And like I said, my only criteria for an assistant or receptionist is that if I taped her mouth shut, would she fart to death, okay? You get you a little geek girl. You know, you walk into 19 dental offices across the street, and they got bulletproof glass window. And you go up to the counter, and you're, not, you're knocking on the window. Knock, knock, knock. And they slide on the door. Uh, yes. And you're like, uh, uh, yeah, I, I chose you to be my dentist. And they go, okay, I need you to fill out this chart. And here's the chart, fill it out. I've got to close the window because I'm back here working. And then they close the window. And then about two minutes later, the guy comes back, knock, knock, knock. And she opens the door, um, what? Ah, uh, I don't have a pen. He's like, yeah, I know you. You're going to try to steal my pen. Well, tight ass has got a pen chained down to the counter. You stand right here with a pen chained down to the counter because you're not walking off with my pen. And then they're standing there with a little chained down pen. And, and then she closes the door because she's got to work. Because in her mind, remember, middle class think a house is an asset. Rich people think it's a liability. Rich people think a dental office is investment. Uh, middle class people think it's overhead and expense and their home and cars and golf clubs are investment. Well, this little receptionist of yours, she thinks work is about paper. It's not about computers, papers, forms. It's about people. You hire introverts. You have to train them to have a relationship. You hire extroverts. And what is the difference in extrovert and introvert? An extrovert is someone, an extrovert, if they walk in a room, they're fueled by people. Okay? An introvert is someone who walks in a room with people, they're drained. Okay, you take an introvert to a party, by 9 o'clock they need Excedrin and, and they're tired and they're exhausted and their mind's blown. If I put an introvert, if I put an extrovert in a room with no windows, close all the doors, and tell her to do accounting work for eight hours, it'll just, an extrovert will just be drained. I mean, she's like, oh my God. She's got to call someone to liven up. She's got to get up and walk around. She feeds and energizes off of people. Okay, if I put an introvert, my bookkeeper, I don't want to say her name, I don't want this to get back to Lori, but we put Lori in a room with no windows, closed all the walls, windows, and all she does is all the accounting on uh, Soft Dent and Peachtree. And I mean, she just, there's nobody bothering her. And if no one's bothering her, she's getting all this work done. And she's like, oh my gosh, I'm getting so much done. Zippity doo dah, zippity day. My oh my, what a wonderful day. And she just feeds off all this productivity and it fuels her. In fact, after we put Lori in that room, the only thing that was in there was a plant. And it was so boring, after six weeks, the plant got up and left. I mean, now if I were to put an extrovert in that room, close all the doors, no windows, um, like uh, 
um, other staff I got. I mean, it just would have wiped them out and drained them. Every 30 minutes, they'd have got up for a bathroom break, coffee break, walked around, made personal phone calls. Uh, so you want people who are fueled by people. Now, since you're a doctor, dentist, lawyer, nurse, registered nurse, engineer, architect, any white-collar sovereign profession is about 76% introverts, 24% extroverts. The general public is reversed. 76% extrovert for the general public, 24% introverts. White-collar sovereign profession licensed professionals attract geeks. I mean, think about it. You're in a university. Who's the only idiot on a Friday night studying calculus? Who's the only idiot trying to get a 4.0? Any extrovert with a brain cell would have been at the school dance, been chasing women, going to the game, having fun, having a life. You show me a guy who walks out of four years of college with a 2.5, I'll show you an extrovert who's good looking with a personality. You show me the valedictorian and that's the one if you shot him, only his mother would notice he was gone, okay? So basically, since you're an introvert geek dentist, Birds of a feather flock together, eagles like eagles, turkeys like turkeys. You surround yourself with introvert geeks, and the customer keeps score on communication values, needs, wants, choices, attitudes, preference, cultures, customs, heuristics, biases. Something went wrong. Something went wrong, and you need to find out what it is. Start asking them on their chart, why did you leave your last dental office? What did you like the most about any dental office you've ever gone to in your life? What did you like the least about any dental office you've gone to in your life? If satisfaction equals perception minus expectations, what are you expecting to have done today? Another thing I need to know is on a one to five, five being perfect, one being bad, what state are your teeth in? Now, if someone says, uh, my teeth are about a four or five, and I look in there and they got three teeth rotted off to the gum line, and they're thinking their teeth are in damn good shape, I know this guy's not buying root canals, crowns, and bridges. He thinks going to a dentist when you pull a rotten tooth and, and go on a partial, a flipper. And if I look at someone and they say my teeth are about a two or a three, and I look in the mouth, they've had their wisdom teeth out, they've had braces, they've had bleaching. I'm looking at some very particular high needs and wants person who probably wants her only three silver fillings replaced with white composite, probably wants bleaching, might want veneers. So you need to know what these people want. You know, the Industrial Revolution was about low diversity, big investment scales of economy. Well, that was yesterday. The Industrial Revolution's gone. Now it's the knowledge resolution, revolution. It's about highly diversified, very specialized customization. It's gone from massification to customization. It's gone from mass to class. No one wants the old black Model T car. Everybody has the same one. They want class. They want customization. They want service, service, service. Our mission statement, today's dental's mission statement, to build a long-term relationship between our staff and our patients so that we can provide quality, consumer-friendly dental services the whole family can value and afford in a happy and healthy environment. And when you say these things, a lot of people say, ah, oh, mission statement's cheesy. Well, you know what? If a mission statement's so cheesy, why is there not one Fortune 500 company that doesn't have one? How come I've never seen a 10K annual report from a publicly traded company or even a 10Q quarterly report from a publicly traded company that did not state openly, openly their mission? If you can't put your mission on a 5x7 index card, how are your customers supposed to differentiate your product from someone else's? The percent of the U.S. population working for the Fortune 500 in 1960 was 33%. 1990, it's 13%. The percent of the U.S. population working in a blue-collar job in 1950 was 40%. 1990, it's 20%. In the year 2000, it's 10%. What does that mean? Well, when it was about massification, everybody worked for Fortune 500, blue-collar jobs, Industrial Revolution. Now, the bigness days are over. The Fortune 500 companies employ 1% less people now and then they sit there and did, I mean, and just actual nominal people than it did in 1960. I mean, 33% of the population worked for them in 1960. Now it's only 13%. That's why what's growing are the smaller businesses because I'm not walking into a, uh, a place and saying, well, I want the same blue car for 14 million other people. Now you're more like to say, well, I bought a car and I took it to a customization place that customized my BMW into a convertible and I paid 5,000 more for that. Why do you go to this bar? Because it's part of the chain. Look at the big chains like Planet Hollywood. What is their stock doing? It's plummeted. Well, you know, it might be really fun and cool to go to Planet Hollywood one time, 
but that's about massification. People rather go to their little bar where they know that guy, where there's a pool table and these Mexican food and these chips. It's all about, do you know my name? Do you have a relationship? Um, market differentiation we talked about last time is really best done with, with cosmetic dentistry. Um, customers want service, availability, and you've got to communicate that simply. You know, we, I don't use my name. If I use my name, if I sell me, everybody wants me. When I sell today's dental, they have no problem going to my three associates who, number one, they wouldn't be in there if they weren't top quality. We dump a lot of money into them for continuing ed. We send them to LVI. We send them to UFP. We send them to Brock Rondeau. We send them to MTS Manji. We send them to Richard Litt. We send them anywhere and everywhere. And right up the street from us is a AMC movie theater. And we have before and after pictures. This is, you can see, this is uh, Monica Lewinsky uh, on the right before she got a job at the White House. And after the left is uh, after she met Bill Clinton. And there it is. There's the logo, visual. You can see that. Today's dental. The phone number is 893-CARE. Everybody in my area has an 893 prefix. And the last word's a visual care. That's real easy to load in your memory. And then I form a visual. 48th Street and Elliott in the Safeway Plaza. And mom says, oh, I know where that is. Here's another bleaching. You deserve to bleach your teeth. Same thing. Logo. Today's dental. 893-CARE. By the way, if you're looking at logo and want to know what their names are, their names are Cuspy, Groovy, and Fissurella. I know. I know that was the first question you were thinking. But, uh, you know, bleaching your teeth. Is bleaching, do you need to bleach your teeth or do you want to? Remember, if it's a need... It's highly cost sensitive. They want to know what their insurance will pay, how much it costs, because they, 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 they need it, but people seldom want what they need, okay? But their want is not based on price, it's based on cash flow. Oh, I want to bleach my teeth, how much is it? And if you say it's $700, and they go, oh, dang, I only have 300 in my savings. See, when you have a want, you buy it if you have the money. It's all based on cash flow, not price. If you only have $100 in the bank, you want a pair of Nikes, or $95, you'll buy them. It's not price sensitive because you want it. If you want it, it's cash flow sensitive. If you need it, it's insurance a premium dependent, it's cost dependent. And here's the easiest market differentiation. Let me tell you this, Th those things on the left there before, those amalgams, full gold crown, I know those full gold crowns are awesome, but you know what? They don't want them, okay? They, they don't want gold crowns. If you're force feeding gold crowns into people because you think it's better, man, have you got a thing to learn. Last year, the United States, did 1.4 million boob jobs. Did one person need a boob job? They wanted a boob job. They're $4,000 on average. They're not paid for by insurance. They did almost a million nose jobs, a million tummy tucks, liposuctions, none of the hair transplants. There's low self-esteem bald men walking around that want Barbie doll rivets in their head. Let them have it. If they want to pay five grand for Barbie doll rivets or wear a rug, if they want it, let them want it. If they want it, they have the money, the financing, they get it. I don't do any amalgams in my office. People always say, well, how did you get your silver fillings down to 0%? I do 100% tooth color fillings. Well, people, it's so easy. The word decision comes from the Latin word decisive, meaning to cut off. The only way you can make a decision is cut off from whatever you were doing before. You got to make a decision. Left or right, make a decision. And what do we do? We took them off the menu. I want everybody to do an exercise on the way home tonight from work or wherever you are, on the way home, I want you to pull into the drive-thru McDonald's, get up to the window, and I want you to order a pepperoni pizza. And the, the 16-year-old's gonna look at you and say, uh, sir, uh, uh, are you on Vicodin? Uh, you're at McDonald's. And they'll say, I, I know, but you got a cook in there and you got a restaurant, and if you have a cook in a restaurant, uh, you can be everything to everybody simultaneously and damn it, make me pizza. They'll say, uh, sir, uh, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna have to call the police if you don't leave the parking lot. And uh, they say, here's our menu. Take it or leave it. This is all we do. This is our unique selling proposition. This is our market differentiation itself. In fact, we not only, not only sell pizza, we just sell hamburgers. In fact, we have to differentiate our Big Mac from a Burger King's Whopper or a Wendy's who uses a square patty because Dave says that he doesn't want to cut any corners, whatever. But you know what? It's a different product. You know when you're at Wendy's, you got a square patty. It's part of the whole differentiation, and it's sweating the details, systems-based. And I'll tell you what I did. Uh, I just took the amalgams off the menu. I took them off probably, uh, I think I took them off in 1991. 
And uh, the, those tooth fillings, sure, it was tough. And I'm sure I had sensitivities. I had problems. But I went back on my FAGD, my MAGD. I talked these problems over with Hornbrook and Dickerson and Dorfman and flew down, spent the day with Dan Fisher at Alternan. I spent the day with Bob Ibsen three or four times and a lot of CE and a lot of visits. Uh, went up and took every one of Gordon Christian's two-day PCC courses. Uh, every time I'd show up to a PCC course, poor Gordon, I'd have five, six pages of notes. He'd get, he'd answer every one of your damn questions. And sure, it's painful. Sure, it costs a lot of money. But cost learning all the money to learn how to do that. I, you know, I was charging 80 bucks for the silver filling, and no one wanted it. Came back, and I charged 140 for the tooth color, and everybody wants it. And I'll tell you what, everybody's always complaining about Delta. And it's just, it's just common. I mean, you want to go get a, you know, people to stand up and cheer. All you do is you go to a seminar and you beat up on Delta and they cheer. Well, let me tell you something, buddy. Uh, you go get your dental society to go sell several billion dollars worth of insurance a year. And if you think you'd do it so differently, you'd be successful. You know, some of the biggest cosmetic dentists, I don't want to say any names, all they do is rank on Delta. I guarantee you if they start a dental insurance company, they couldn't sell $10 million of insurance for their $10,000 veneer jobs if, if you put a gun to their head. They, they, they don't have no idea what they're talking about. Let me tell you something, though. Insurance is about dentistry needs. Financing and advertising and marketing is about selling once based on cash flows. And, you know, don't worry that the ADA is not advertising on TV. You know, Bob Ibsen's Denmat is. Uh, Dorfman's doing it. Uh, the big Fortune 500, George Bush said that free enterprise was a thousand points of life. Free enterprise dental companies are, are coming through. William Zyvaclair is doing a lot of consumer marketing. Gosh, I see Bob Ibsen's Rembrandt on MTV, VH1. Hell, he spent a million dollars um, endorsing the uh, Miss America or Miss Universe contest or whatever, sponsored by Rembrandt. And then as far as these commercials, I don't care if the commercial's being beamed to 200 million Americans during the Super Bowl uh, for however many zillions of dollars that is. I run my own commercials in my waiting room. There's my waiting room, plaques, diplomas. Uh, I use Dental Vision uh, from Meredith Communications. Uh, they have stock videos. Most of the dentistry on the case there are my photos, but it don't matter. You can send in your own, use theirs, whatever. Um, you can call them up, 1-800-660-0409, 1-800-660-0409. Don't even tell them you heard it from me. I don't get a dime for it, and I don't want a dime for it. It's, just, it's good advice. It's not anything about trying to sell you something. Um, a lot of dentists, I go to the labs, they're still trying to do uh, consumer-focused dentistry, and they're sending in, you know, first 10 crowns, uh, first by cuspid forward, or second by cuspid forward, upper and lower, which are anterior 10 teeth, they're still sending in porcelain fused to metal crowns, and they're asking the lab man to do a porcelain margin on the, ant on the, on the uh, buckle. Now people, it's not, you're not looking at metal, you're looking at a dark root. If you took that PF, that metal casting off, light would illuminate the tooth and that root is yellow. The next time you see the anterior PFM, look at the root color. Slide the crown over it and the metal, it's like, it's like the root now turns dark. It's because you're looking in a window of a house with no light on. Then you take off that PFM, it's illuminated. People always come up to me and say, well, you know, I, I'd rather do a PFM than a Targus Vectoris or an Empress or a Proceris or an Empress too. Duh! Who the hell wouldn't do a PFM? I mean, take, give me any PFM, fill it up with a vitromere, slam it on, get a rubber brush, clean off. I mean, my God, that is so easy. It's brainless. Hell, you can have your dental assistant seat all those. I mean, my gosh, that, that's, of course it's harder to bond on an anterior uh, empress or uh, uh, bond on a posterior targus vectoris procerus in SRAM um, or uh, what have you. Of course it's a lot harder. I'm not doing it because I prefer that. I'm doing it because the customer values it. Women absolutely hate PFMs. End of story. You probably can get away with it on all eight of her molars. Most of the time, okay? But I'm telling you, you get first by custom four and you put a PFM and she looks at that and she sees that dark little root area. She hates it. I mean, come on. Do you get up every morning and, and do your hair and curling irons and mousse and pluck your eyebrows and put on makeup and girdles and hoses and and shave your legs and all that. Do you do any of that crap? Hell, in the morning, all I do is brush and floss and shower, and the only thing I use in the shower is a bar of soap. In fact, I usually even pee in the shower when I'm done just to save a toilet trip. I mean, I can do the whole damn thing in four minutes. 
Of course I don't care if you give me a gold crown or a PFM. Um, what do I look like, a Calvin Klein model? But that's not your market. Your market is mom. And then you're sitting there telling me, well, yeah, but I just did it on grandpa because he wouldn't care. Yeah, you think grandpa and dad and the kids don't care. And then mom always sends in the kids first. And then they come home. She says, let me look at that feeling. <gasps> oh, my gosh, that's so ugly, that silver feeling. I, and he wants to do three cows of me. I'm never going in there. And then she comes back and there's grandpa. And she's saying, Grandpa, let me see that crown. Oh my God, that's so ugly. And he wants to do two crowns with me. No way, I'm not going back. Remember, why didn't McDonald's put in the play area for children? You know, when I was 10 years old, the year was 1972, Burger King comes out with this big old campaign about flame broiled or fried. You guys remember that? Let me tell you, you know how hard this is to give a lecture to two cameramen who won't even show their face? They look like they're stoic Mayan Indians. And... Uh, so you sit there and they come out of this flame broiled or fried and here, here's Burger King and they're sitting there, uh, you know, flame broiled, fried. Well, Ray Kroc, first of all, Ray Kroc didn't care if it had to be flame broiled or fried. He didn't care about Burger King. He wanted to play the game. He wanted to play the game to win. And he never, like all billionaires, billionaires always tell you, never listen to anyone else or you're going to be just as stupid as them. It's impossible to have independent thoughts in an interdependent society. He says, you got to get back to your basics. Forget trig, calculus, math. Forget what everybody's saying in the papers. Think. Go back to Gilligan's Island. What's the nature of the beast? And he would listen to all these commercials about flame broiled or fried. Then he would listen to his customers. Both eye, one eye on the customer, one eye on cost. And he listened to him debate flame broiled or fried. Remember economics, only three things happen. You make decisions based on how you see the score. And you chase incentives, rewards, punishments. And he sits there and he listens to mom and dad talk about flame broiled fried. Then when it got time to make the decision, who made the decision? Mama bear, remember, inside the house. Mom makes the decisions outside the house is dad. That's how society's functioned for about the last 10,000 years of recorded history. And mom's sitting there. She's in charge of the family. And she sits there and says, boo-boo, where do you want to eat? And boo-boo goes, I want to play in McDonald's and play in the balls. And Ray Kroc said, it's not about flame broiled or fried. The, four, the mom makes a decision based on where the four-year-old goes. And you know why we got mom? Because we give a toy in the Happy Meal. We have a Happy Meal that's focused directly on the kid. And we have a little play area for balls. He says, it ain't about flame broiled or fried. If dad said, mom, please, not McDonald's. Mom would say, well, honey, let me check. Boo-boo, where do you want to go? And if Boo-boo says McDonald's, mom says to husband, get in the car, we're going to McDonald's in the story. You do bleaching, tooth-colored fillings, all porcelain, Procera, Targus Vectorus, uh, Empress, Empress 2, whatever you have to do uh, on uh, First by Custard Ford for mom. And if you sit there and you end up doing it on dad, you make sure Mom knows that you wouldn't do that on her, but you did on dad because he didn't care it was cheap or whatever, but it's all about communication. Not what you say, it's how you say it. It's not what you hear, but how you hear it. Now, market segmentation climbs a stairway over time. I mean, over time, value increases as civilization progresses. Remember, in 1920 in the United States, diphtheria, tuberculosis, and diarrhea are the top three causes of death. Now it's, gosh darn, uh, cancer, uh, it's heart disease, cancer, and cerebral vascular disease. Well, go back when you were a little kid. When I was a little kid, mom would uh, make a cake from scratch. probably cost 50 cents. Time went by. Society got more productive. Then they put it all in a Duncan Hines cake mix. Well, time got by, and mom finally said, hell, I'm not even making a birthday cake. It ain't worth it. I'll go to Bash's or Safeway or, or the mega food store, and I'll get it for $15. Hell, now people, even middle class, even poor middle class, say the hell with all that. We'll go to Chuck E. Cheese and pay $50 for the entire party. Same thing with uh, women doing their hair. When I was little, I had five sisters, and they would buy all their permanents in a box and do them in the kitchen. I remember, you know, you'd be coming up for the basement or something, hearing someone screaming, my head's burning, my head's burning. They'd be in there rinsing water and trying to put out a fire. I don't care what the hell happened. When it was all over. They'd look in the mirror and then cry for three days. And, uh, and they were always, they were always trying to do permanents on me, and they did. They, they did about 10 or 15 on me. I always wonder if I'd have my hair if I wouldn't let my sisters experiment with all those fuzzy permanents on my head. But the deal is, now no one does a permanent in their gosh darn front room anymore. They all go to have a professional do it. Um, and, and, and people pay big money. Some pay, sometimes people walk in there and pay $80, $90 to have their bouffant fixed up. And, uh, and then what happens? They come into a dentist. This lady comes into me. A dentist, actually a dentist, a good friend of mine, redid this anterior crown three times. And th th I just laugh every time I see this case. It reminds me of the old adage, if your only tool's a hammer, everything looks like a nail. I mean, what, what did the dentist think? The shade's gone? See, he doesn't know how to do ortho. Ortho is the top 
number one want-based procedure that's most expensive in dentistry. Everybody's chasing a $10,000 veneer. You know why? Everybody wants to do a $10,000 veneer case because every one of those instructors, you know all their names, have never done a single orthodontic case in their life. So their only tool is a drill. And let me ask you, if your kid had crooked teeth, would you want all his teeth filed down with veneers and gingivitis? When you do upper 10 veneers on a 22-year-old, are you telling me that by the time the kid's 32, 42, 52, 62, 72, 82, that none of them teeth are gonna have to be retreated? How many of them are gonna fall off or die or need redone? Anytime you do 10 upper veneers on a 25 year old, you condemn those teeth to a life of retreatment. And what's wrong with this guy? They came in my office. The person didn't want ortho. I, I, I cut off that current. I had that going in about 15 minutes. And then I said there, this was one month later. That's two months later. I mean, come on. I mean, you know, three months. And the dentist across the said, well, I told her she knew ortho, but she didn't want to go in there for two years. See, you don't sell with information. That's the number one rules. In fact, I'm giving this lecture in uh, the Tom Hopkins International Studio, which is really romantic to me because when I was um, 18 years old, 19 years old, reading Tom Hopkins' book, he was my idol. And here it is 10, 15 years later, I'm standing in a studio. This guy will never know what he did for me. But I'm telling you, uh, I mean, how many times did you hear it from all the gurus of sales? If information was king, the libraries would be packed. You go into the libraries on a Friday night, there's two drunks and a wino in there, or three kids who won't have their first date till they're 45. And you sit there and you, you look at their number one person in real estate and sales and Omar Reed, you could give him a rock and a stick and he could sell a $30,000 rehab to anyone because he's enthusiastic, he's passionate, he's, vi he's gregarious, he's, it's all in the presentation. When you go to a restaurant, why is there parsley by it? Well, if you can't do an ortho case, you can't sell an ortho case. And the orthodontist doesn't want you to learn ortho because they're thinking, as Stephen Covey would say, in scarcity. They're not thinking in abundancy. Does that orthodontist know that when you've never done one single orthodontic case and you have a family that you just go in there and all you look is for the things you sell. You sell x-rays, cleanings, fillings, and crowns. And that's why so many adults need orthodontic surgery because they went in every six months to get their teeth cleaned by a dentist who's never done a single orthodontic case. So virtually they were getting care by someone asleep at the wheel because the orthodontists are so worried that the orthodontist, that, that the general dentist will steal one piece of the pie, it doesn't get that if the, every dentist in America could do one ortho case, the pie would be twice as large. I mean, when ortho came out in 1950, I mean, you're doing five cases a year. Now half these dental offices do, uh, orthodontists are doing 15 cases a month and there's 5,900 orthodontists. So you figure it out, it's a growing pie. Uh, the $8 trillion economy is gonna get bigger. Learn to do ortho. This is the greatest one. Um, Brock Rondo, unbelievable. You can call Brock Rondo and uh, teach you how to do ortho. He's out of Canada, 1-800-308-3074. That's 1-800-308-3074. And you know, the one thing that's the funniest about specialists, if you ever go give a lecture to a room full of 100 specialists, yesterday I was at a seminar with MTS Manji and uh, it was just for specialists. Not a single, not one specialist brought in his team. You know, they always wonder why their staff acts like employees, and yet they always leave them home like they're some, uh, you know, like when you go to a third world country, you know, the wives wrap themselves up in a veil and they're not allowed to speak in public and they, they can't own property and, you know, the average man can have uh, four wives and, you know, they're basically treated like dogs. That's how most specialists think of their staff, and it's represented by, you, you go to continuing ed. All the endodontists, oral surgeons, orthodontists, periodontists, pedonists, prosthodontists, they never bring staff to continue ed. General dentists, about one-third of them, when I go to seminar, one-third of the dental offices bring all their staff. The other two-thirds don't bring any of their staff because, you know, it's Dr. Tightass. He's the same guy that has a lockbox over his thermostat. I mean, how pathetic and cheap can you get when you're locking up the thermostat in a thousand square foot dental office? I mean, that's a person in fearfully falling forward instead of flippantly flying freely. And the deal is simple this. I can carve up dentistry into two pies and show you the income difference we talked about. You know, if you have all your chairs going once every day and the other guys have a chair that was never used two out of three days, these guys make $70,000 a year more. If you just charge what the specialists do in a five mile radius, on aggregate, you make $70,000 more than the other dentist. Um, if you know, if you take your staff to continuing education with you. Now, I'm not talking about just practice, man. I'm talking about implants, ortho, bonding, veneer, bleaching, the whole nine yards. Those guys almost double 
the national average, the national average dentist makes 122,000 a year, and the average dentist that I've seen, I've lectured 500 times, countries all around the world, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Poland, you name it, and my gosh, I mean, I mean, I would say the average dentist who brings all the staff to continue ed, on average makes about $250,000 a year because they understand the picture. And that's why I like Brock Rondeau because Brock, always on his course, it's four three-day weekends, but, they, but session two through four, he brings his June Williamson, who's his head um, expanded functions auxiliary unit, RDH, CTA, and uh, June teaches the staff. I mean, if you go into an orthodontist's office, if your staff are fully trained, Heck, you only need 10 or 15 minutes to see a patient. I've seen more dentists do ortho and say, well, you know, it's not very profitable. Yeah, because, hell, they'd schedule an hour for each person that came in to get a band check. That's because their auxiliaries are supposed to be seen and not heard. They're supposed to wear saris and veils. Uh, they're supposed to have no property rights. Uh, you know, you know, people look at orthodontics. It's glue and rubber bands. You make this big production out of it. I personally, if I was a dictator, I wouldn't care if the cosmetologist would want to do ortho. Why the hell do you need eight years of college and be a doctor to do glue and rubber bands? I mean, if you carried out the same rationale, all your cosmetologists would have to be nuclear brain surgeons to cut your hair. I mean, ortho is glue and rubber bands, and it's 99% reversible. Here's the top three greatest ones, in my opinion, Brock Rondeau which you can call it 519-455-4110. Richard Lett, who's with MT Asmanji, 810-646-5220. Or Bob Garrity, he's a fantastic, he's a great one, 918-652-4404. Some of the legends are, uh, I don't know if they're still doing it, Jack Sheridan's a great one, Harry Green's a great one. Uh, but th those, are the, uh, those are the main guys right there. Um, from 1960 to 1993, the percentage of Americans with a college education tripled. 1960, 40% of America had a high school education. 1993, it was 78% had a high school education. You know, if you go back to 1960, doctors were gods. Why? We spoke 5,200 words of Latin and Greek, and only 40% of our patients had a high school education. Now, 30 years later... The people with the, the percentage of Americans with a college education tripled and the percentage of people with a high school education doubled from 40 to 78 percent. People look, you're not a doctor on some pedigree. You got to tell these guys information. You got to give them instructions. You got to give them warranties. These people, these people, you can tell them that they got an oat cell carcinoma. They go home and get on Yahoo and Microsoft and dump in a word search. And, and since it's their lung and not yours, they'll go read about their own oat cell carcinoma for three days and three nights. And, and you walk back in and that cardi oncologist thinks he's going to walk in and tell this guy something in five minutes. He's got another thing coming. Uh, these people are educated. In fact, the number one thing that's going to happen in the new millennium is that knowledge, you know, the year 1900, you know, where management got started is all the managers basically had gone to college. And they were about 1% of the population there from super rich parents, the Carnegie's, the Mel, the Rockefellers, what have you. And most of the people they didn't go, were illiterate. They hadn't graduated from high school. So that's where management got its base. We're real, real smart. You're real, real dumb. We'll stand behind you, watch every move. We'll beat you. We'll penalize you. Well, you know, the, the new millennium, knowledge is not only, not only for the elitist, richest kings and monarchs, knowledge is a commodity. It's not even valued anymore. I mean, God, you got, I mean, how valuable is an MBA if 200,000 people a year are graduating with an MBA? How valuable is a high school education if eight out of every 10 Americans have one? In fact, let me tell you something right now. I guarantee you right now, the year 2000, a high school, a college degree today, a four-year college degree has the exact same value as a high school diploma in 1960. Because the same percentage of people had a high school diploma in 1960 have a college degree today. Because the supply and demand equals value. If only 1% of the population graduated from college, it's worth everything in the world. Hell, if 4 out of 10 did and 8 out of 10 graduated from high school, it's not nearly as important. Listening is more important than talking. That is why God gave us two ears and only one mouth. My mother said that to me all the time. She wondered why I never shut up one time in 18 years. Influence on dental visits. Adults were asked to rate a series of factors they might make them more likely to visit the dentist. Ratings were based on a 10-point scale, where one minute would have no impact and 10 would mean it would greatly increase the likelihood they would visit the dentist. Number one is eliminate pain. 
Uh, and, and people laugh at that, but come on, that means it's a need. You, you need to get out of pain. You don't have to go get your teeth cleaned. Number two is that they reduce their fee. This is perfect market segmentation. Number three is if, if your dentist was recommended by someone you trust. Number four was your dentist was friendlier or more caring. And then I asked these dentists, why don't you do we care calls at night? You know what? You gave this guy a shot. You took 1600 bucks out of their wallet. You did a root canal bill and crown for an hour and a half. Why, why in the world? I mean, I mean, what's the golden rule? That whoever has all the gold makes all the rules? Or is it treat other people like you want to be treated? That's the rule of customer service. Treat other people like you want to be treated. How inhuman are you that after doing a root canal build up and a crown on some guy for 1600 bucks, that after dinner, before you nestle onto the couch and read a book or play with the kids or play a game or whatever, whatever, it's 6.30, takes you two minutes, you walk in the kitchen, you have your number, and you call them up and say, Jim, Howard Ferran, your dentist. Don't sit there and put artificial barriers to communication by always calling yourself a doctor. That's low self-esteem dysfunctional. I mean, I know dentists who staff... And hell, I know dentists to their wives call them doctor. I mean, when you walk into your room and say, I'm a doctor and you're not, you're dysfunctional, okay? People don't communicate with doctors, dentists, lawyers, priests, rabbis, politicians, senators, congressmen, because that's societal, that's raising artificial barriers to impede communication. And the only way you're going to have a long-term relationship is to have solid communication. I always say, Jim. Howard Ferran, your family dentist. Hey, buddy, how you doing from that root canal? Just calling to make sure the anesthetic wore off and everything's okay. And they go, God, Howard, uh, God, thanks for calling, buddy. I, uh, hell, I had a gallbladder out and uh, never saw the doctor again. And uh, uh, th hell, I had a vasectomy. The damn thing swelled up to the size of a black cantaloupe and uh, left messages for three days trying to find out what went wrong and uh, never did get a call back. And uh, hey, thanks a lot, buddy. But uh, yeah, everything's fine. And then they always ask you a question and... and um, that's why I was doing it. I can't believe how stupid the question are. They always say things like, uh, well, uh, Howard, now, now, or, or Dr. Fran or Howard or whatever, but, uh, now they got you on the phone. Uh, can I ask you a question? Uh, those, anab uh, those antibiotics you gave me, uh, am I supposed to take them? Uh, no, Jim, they're suppositories for your cat. Why don't you get your cat right by the phone right now and insert all 28 pen VK? And, uh, or they say things like, uh, especially old men, old men ask the dumbest questions. They say things like, uh, Dr. Fran, I, uh, I took two of those Vicodin and vomited. Well, Frank, have you ever had pain and taken a pill for pain and not vomited? Uh, bufferin. There you go, Frank. There you go. You're a genius and you don't even know it. And, uh, but you know what? It's loving. It's caring, concern. And if you don't think that's a fun phone call, you got a bad attitude. Why do I call my wife flawless, worship the ground she walks on and give her all my damn money? So I can have sex on demand, okay? And if you sit there and you say you don't want to talk to your patients, their patient don't want to talk to you. If you say on every business card I've ever given out, I have my home phone number on it. And you know what? At the last parting shot I give every one of my patients, I'll sit there and say, hey, Jim, uh, you did good during your root canal. Uh, I got a really good success rate with these. I mean, I probably don't have to redo, you know, maybe more than two or three a year, and I do at least one or two every day. Uh, but I want you to know something. If this thing works perfect forever and you never tell me about it, that's fine, okay? But if something goes wrong and I don't need to know about it, I can't, that's the feedback I need more than anything to change my game, okay? When you're playing basketball and you make a, sh and when you shoot, you, you need to know if it goes in or if it misses, okay? You change your shot. If anything goes wrong, I need to be the first to know about it. Here's my card. It's got my office number, my home number. If you have any problems with my root canal, you call me here, call me at home. I need to know. Here's your instructions. Here's your warranty. You did good. Any questions? And they're just like, uh, wow, you got your home number? And then I said, yeah, and uh, are you going to be home tonight? Yeah, well, um, what, what time are you going to be home? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let, I'll, I'll call you probably about 6 or 7. And they're just like, damn, he's going to call me at 6 or 7. And uh, yeah, I want to see how this going. Make sure, right, buddy? I mean, come on, this is a root canal. And, you know, I pulled your wisdom teeth. I, you know, I did two crowns, two fillings. And it's just loving, caring, concern. And, and here's the number four deal where they were saying, they would be more like, 45% of Americans said they would be more likely to go to the dentist that they thought he was friendlier and more caring. And you're walking in there and you're calling yourself Dr. Fayran and you're unlisted and you don't give out your home number. You're basically a insecure, paranoid schizophrenic. 42% um, said they would be more likely to go to the dentist if he better explain what the hell he was doing. Why did Gordon Christian make 12 patient education videos five to seven minutes long because he was bored because he had nothing to do 
because Rella cut him off? I mean, what the, what do you think he did it? Because he's got a PhD in psychology. People want to know what a root canal is. They want to know what a filling is. They want to know what this stuff is. Gordon's I got a doctorate in dentistry and psychology and a master's in prosthodontics. And he knows the game. He's six years old. He's the Yoda of dentistry. If he comes out with a product, there's probably 99 more reasons why you need it than the one you can think of why you shouldn't buy it. Just get those tapes. Get his clinical education stuff, get his patient education stuff, and the best value, continuing my the most continuing education value for your dollar for least money is Gordon's, I don't know how many, there are 10 or 12 two-day PCC courses. You know, you fly into Salt Lake, you rent a car, you drive up to Provo. It's kind of like all the Muslims, you know how they always have to go back to Mecca. Well, you know, all dentists in the world need to go to Provo at least five or 10 times, touch the Black Rock, Gordon, and uh, go in there. And you know, all of his courses are like, they're like five ninety nine. You know, so many of these institutes are eight thousand, ten thousand, thirty thousand, eight million, ten trillion. Some take six full weeks to learn their information, and, and you know, they, and they couldn't do it like LVI and UAP. You know, they go in there. They, they go Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. MTS Monzi goes Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So you can still produce Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. But some of the old institutes, they're like. Monday, they start Monday at 8 and quit 12, Friday at noon so you can lose a whole seven days of productivity. But I'm telling you, Gordon's lean and mean. There's Sundays and Mondays. You fly up there Saturday night, you go in there Sunday and Monday. Some of them are Monday, Tuesday. Two days in and out. Gordon cuts to the chase, levels it out hard. 35% um, of the Americans said that they would be more likely to go to the dentist if he had expanded or weakened hours. So come on. 60% eliminate pain, 53% reduce their fees, 45% if you are recommended by someone they trust, 45% if you are more friendly and more caring, 42% if you better explain what you're doing, 39% if, you, uh, if your dentist took more advantage of new technology, lasers, intro cameras, micro air abrasion, uh, Cerac 2 Siemens machine. By the way, if you're laughing at that Cerac 2 Siemens machine, uh, Patterson sold 500 of them last year. And last but not least, 35% said if their dentist had expanded or weekend hours. And that comes from the ADA Survey Center, 1997 Survey of Consumer Attitudes and Behaviors Regarding Dental Issues. That's why I'm a member of the ADA. That's why I've been paid my dues every year since freshman year of dental school to now. Even though, you know, I've got some complaints from them, they're, they're, not, they're not complaints out of hatred or destruction. They're very focused, pointed critics. It's simply all I want is the right to vote. I think that would make better leadership. I was born in 1962. That was a hundred years after Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. And women couldn't vote till dang near 40 years later, 1911, when Susan B. Anthony led the suffrage movement. Here we are at the year 2000, and I can't even vote for the president of the ADA or the president of the State Dental Society. And we live in the oldest democracy in the world, 225 years old. Three and a half million people died for my right to vote, and I can't even vote for their president of the ADA or the Arizona State Dental Association, they would have a lot better leadership. You know, I lecture around the United States, 98% of dentists on any given day sitting in my lecture, one a week, 50 a year, 98% cannot name the president of the ADA. Well, how can you be a leader if no one knows who you are? But I'm still a member of the ADA because of stuff like this, research. Economic behaviors. Um, th these guys, they, they get an A++ in their library. They get an A++ in their ADA survey center. Yet these guys won't even let me lecture at their national convention anymore because I call for the right to vote. They're so funny. Uh, name me a successful species that eats their young. Wayne Gretzky says to go where the puck is going to be, not where it is. Is his definition of success. Everybody always asks the same thing to Dennis Rodman. Well, how do you get so many rebounds? And it's because he's not chasing the ball. He's predicting where the ball is going to be when it rebounds. <laughs> Wayne Gretzky goes to where the puck is going to be, not where it is. And same thing with Dennis Rodman. These guys instinctually know how that ball is going to bounce, where that puck is going to go. Customers want information, choices, and control in a convenient, courteous, professional retail setting. That is the only way today's consumer can reach self-mastery. That's the words of, of uh, Regina Herzlinger, PhD, Harvard economist. And I'll tell you, um, I have more nasty letters, well, the most nasty letters, I guess, from the ADA guard that uh, get mad when I say that we should have the right to vote for the president of the ADA. But when dentists hear me saying that you should practice dentistry in a retail setting, the word retail 
It's so hard for them to swallow. They're just like, you know, it's guys like you, Howard, that are ruining dentistry. How could I be ruining dentistry if I'm sitting there getting 2,000 new patients a year and people are saying, thanks for being open in the evenings. Thanks for being open on Saturdays. Thanks for financing this dentistry. Thanks for doing all this. Thanks for, thanks for answering my unmet needs, wants, and desires. If you want to grow dentistry to a $70, $80 billion industry, you're going to start giving these people what they want not just trying to dogmatically force down their throat what they need. The definition of an entrepreneur is anyone who moves their limited resources of money, time, and capital from a lower return to a higher return. So you got $500 in your wallet. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to go buy a, a new uh, putter? Uh, come on, your golf game, you barely break 100 unless you cheat. Uh, you're never going to be a Tiger Woods. Why don't you sit there? $500 would be a monthly lease payment on a, on a new operatory. It'd be a monthly lease payment on a Syrac too. It'd be a monthly lease payment on a micro air abrasion. Why don't you, entrepreneurs put their money, time and capital in the maximum return. They don't take their limited money and dump it into a bigger house, a bigger car, a boat. Uh, you know, it, why is it that everyone I meet without a dime to their name has a three wheeler, a motorcycle and a jet ski? And then every gosh darn millionaire I meet, you give them $50,000 and say, well, do you want to buy a, you want to buy a cabin? And they're like, well, I would, but see, Intel's trading at about 115 and I think I'm going to buy Intel instead. Uh, then I say, darn, does this mean I'm going to have to focus on the consumer's unmet needs, wants, and desires? Uh, hello, I have limited resources and unlimited needs, wants, and desires. That's the customer talking back. The American economic system automatically sorts out winners from losers by permitting the customers to pick their favorites. That's what Adam Smith said in 1776 when he came out with his book, The Wealth of Nations, which was about free markets, when it collided with Benjamin Franklin's Declaration of Independence, which had free people, and when free people hit free markets, boom, America exploded, where today four out of 100 of the world's people have 25 cents of every dollar of the economy. We had eight trillion dollar economy last year and the globe was 32 trillion. And the, it's because the American economic system of comparative advantage says this, look, you, Jim, you traded two chickens for Henry's pig, okay? We don't know why you wanted to trade two chickens for a pig, but if you guys make a trade, you each thought you were getting the advantage or you wouldn't have made it. Well, Adam Smith says that every time two people trade, each person thinks they're getting the better deal. One's going home and say, I can't believe you gave me a pig for two chickens. And the other day, and he said they're going, he's saying, God dang, if I had another chicken, I'd puke. Then they're going home saying, can you believe that dummy gave us two chickens for our stupid pig? Have you seen her pig? He just sits around and licks himself all day long. And this guy's going to take it home and eat it. Our pig eats his own manure. And this guy gave me two good chickens for it. See, it's comparative advantage when everybody thinks they're trading for their own self-interest. Everybody on their own makes the highest quality decisions so the economy as a whole moves faster, efficiently down the road. That was the economic genius insight of Adam Smith, which to this day, no one can figure out how this guy thought of that comparative advantage and how the invisible hand were when everybody is making decisions on their own best self-interest. Everything's done the most efficiently, the most expediently. Um, two eyes of an entrepreneur, as we said, one's, one's focused on the customer's unlimited needs, wants, and desires. The other one's focuses on cost leadership for the customer's limited resources. Um, good lovers, says Abraham Maslow, people, may, one may, people, one may say, become good lovers only when they can accept others as they are and can then enjoy and like them rather than being bothered and irritated and disimproving. That's the way dentists, dentists aren't good lovers. Uh, you know, my wife told me that, uh, she said, people that go bald from the front are just, they're good, uh, they're, they're thinkers. And people who go bald from the back are good lovers. So it's people like me who go bald everywhere, they just think they're good lovers. But the deal is that Dentists are always upset telling me how dumb Delta is, how dumb Blue Cross and Blue Shield is, how dumb their patients are, how dumb their staff are, and eventually you find them hanging by the ropes in their basement water pipe, okay? Look, if you want to be a good lover, if you want to be a good businessman, you start accepting people as they are. And you accept others as they are and you learn to enjoy them and like them and, and learn to love their diversity. I mean, I guarantee you, I could, I could be college roommates for four years with Dennis Rodman. 
I mean, I think that would be a trip. That, can you think of anybody weirder in your whole life? And then, and then I could marry Madonna for three or four years. I mean, that isn't the number one most high maintenance chick. You notice she's supposedly so good looking, but no one's ever uh, married her for longer than a year. But you wouldn't try to change them. You would just sit there and uh, just like accept their diversity. In all relationships, understanding the feelings of others is key to creating stronger relationships. So it's about mutual understanding, not dogmatically force feeding the needs of the marketplace, as Adam Smith said in The Wealth of Nations in 1776. The key to economics is humans have imperfect brains, they gather incomplete information, and generally make low quality decisions. They're very challenging to understand, they're even more challenging to predict, and that is why I will tell you today that America has 260 million Americans and they only have 200 billionaires. 3.8 out of every 100 people are a millionaire. You basically have a, that's wrong, it's 3.8 out of the 100 million households are millionaires. There's 100 million households living in 300,000 neighborhoods and 3.8 households, because you can't really say how many are millionaires because it's the, his money, her money. You say it's his money, but then you get divorced, find out it's kind of hers too. So, so they, they track millionaires by uh, households. And um, so you got 3.8 million households that are millionaires, but you only got 200 billionaires. That's why I'm telling you that the billionaires, by the way, how come the billionaires all forgot to uh, get their MBA? You notice everybody has an MBA, makes about seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 a year. And everybody who's a billionaire doesn't have a business degree. Half of them didn't go to college because everybody at college is trying to teach you what professors say is the answer to the universe. But if he has all the answers to the universe, how come he doesn't have a pot to piss in? Okay. So the billionaires, the billionaires say that the academics take it out to higher differentiated, more levels, more complexity. And the billionaires go the other way. They go back down and they, they think things like, why does mama, uh, get the kids during a divorce and daddy doesn't. Billionaires are the ones, you know, you go to a soccer game or a hockey game or a basketball game, the, the less educated people are totally into the game. The billionaires are sitting there back and just looking at all the people like, why do they like this sport? Why do they like cotton candy? What, what does cotton candy and peanuts and beer and pop have in common? Why does this thing excite them so much? Do you know, you know where soccer actually comes from? When one tribe would overrun another tribe, they would cut the king's head off and kick it around and play games with the, with the victor's head. Billionaires know that stuff instinctually. Billionaires know people. They know apes. They love to watch people. You ask any billionaire, what is your number one hobby? They go, you know, I just like to go to the mall and just walk around and just look at people. Smart people have their eye on people. Dumb people are studying trigonometry trig and trying to find out how the ruler works. One in every five people watch Wheel of Fortune every day, okay? At least that's what Vanna White said, okay? So these people shouldn't be too hard to figure out, okay? I think dentistry, you need a brain the size of a parakeet to figure it out. I mean, I mean, we already said it from the ADA survey. I already told you. Rewind this tape five minutes or uh, the ADA tells you what they want. Um, as they get smarter, these people are going to have higher expectations. Peter Drucker, who's the man who put management in the dictionary, said that it's a triangle of success. He says it's three things. He says you have to train the customer to use your product or service. For instance, if you sell a product or service and you don't teach me how to use it or take care of it or whatever, then people go home and they're very dissatisfied. So you have to train the customer how to use your product or service or they won't even appreciate it. Number two is you got to make the high quality product or service. You got to get either best product or best service. Because if you get the best price and you have crappy service, you don't sell your best price. Walmart told that. Walmart's got best price. But he's also, you walk into Walmart, you walk into Kmart, Sears, TG&Y, Gibson's, J.C. Penney's. You walk into any Kmart. You'll walk in there and here I'm a man, my, one of my four boys call me up and say, Dad, on the way home, will you get me some uh, rollerblade hockey shoelaces? <coughs> I'll pull into Kmart, I'll walk in there, I'll start walking around. What's your first impression? First impression, set and lead. Never get a second chance to make a first impression. And you start walking around, you start saying, my gosh, where are they? I can't find them. Does anybody work here? And you start looking around. Does anybody work here? Finally, you go to some guy and say, excuse me, sir, do you work here? Now you just pissed him off. Cause he's like, no, I just look like someone who works at Kmart. And then they go home that night and throw away their outfit and yell at their wife, honey, 
you picked out this outfit and the damn guy thought I was the manager at Kmart. I'm never wearing this again. And he gets all upset and everything. And you're just walk and the whole thing's a negative first impression. You walk into gosh darn Walmart. You walk right in the front door and there's some minimum wage toothless greeter out there saying, Hi, thank you for shopping at Walmart. And you say, Hey buddy, do you know where shoestrings are for rollerblade hockeys? Hell yeah, I might only have seven teeth, but I know where the shoelaces are. Go to aisle four, right to the hey, do you want me to walk to there? No, no. I mean, it's it's all best service with best price. If you got the best quality, no service. You can't have best price and no service, best quality, no service. You gotta have either best price or best quality along with best service and then study how the customer actually used the product or service. It is amazing how people will come out with a product and they modify it and remodify it and remodify it because they find out how the product was intentionally meant to be used, wasn't even used that way. Uh, you know what these people want. They want, I mean, go back to the basics. Go back to franchise. You name me a franchise. You know, I have a patient that's not successful. I have a patient of mine that actually, I, I hope I don't get sued for saying this, but um, he owns these, these Amico, trans is that what they're called, Amico transmissions? And he said to me something very interesting. He says, you know what, Howard? He says, you're awfully successful. I was at a party at his house one night. He owns like four of these. He said, you know, you and me got a lot in common because we are in the same field. And I said, what do you mean, transmissions industry? He goes, well, no one knows how their transmission works or doesn't work. And no one knows what a root canal is or no one can diagnose their own cavity. He said, you know, the best, the best transmission people in the world, the best transmission people in the world are in the wrong part of town. They have a, a, a fence around their property. They got a Doberman Pinscher back there. They got five cars upside down. Uh, Mom drives on the, on the car lot. And she's scared. It's in the bad part of town. There's Doberman pinches barking. There's all these cars busting into parts. And she walks in there and some man walks out, no uniform, no name tag. He's six years old. He sees your car. He's done. Oh, he, oh, I know exactly. He's thinking to himself, I know exactly what that is. That was the Ford. That was the year they did this or this or this and that. I know exactly what needs to be done. He looks at the eye and says, I can do this job. Take me four hours. Cost 500 bucks. And mom's looking at the grease under his nails, no uniform, no name tag, no warranty, no instructions, no brand name, no umbrella. She's thinking, I don't know a damn thing about transmission, but I know this place looks like a tornado hit it. I don't know. So she gets in the car and she drives Amico. Why? It's in the yellow pages. It's open seven to seven, seven days a week. It has a warranty. And who walks out there to fix her transmission? Some 24-year-old kid out of transmission school. It's only done three transmissions in his life. Mom doesn't care because it comes with a warranty, comes with instructions, it's well lit, there's no Dobermans barking at her, everybody's in a uniform name tag. They put on rubber gloves. There's not even oil on the floor. And you know what? It costs you 20% more to do it in a franchise as you would have it done at a mom and pop store. And you know what's funny is everybody picks the brand name because they feel safer, it's consistent, it's instructions, it's uniforms, it's name tags, it's marketing, it's brand name, it's basically a no-brainer. Uh, consumerism, it starts with the We Care calls. The same night any patient gets an injection, the person who gave the injection will call the patient at night or the next morning and make sure everything's going fine. Then a week later, the dental assistant who assists the procedure will call to make sure everything is going fine after the patient had a week to drive around the block. When you call them that night, you're still a doctor, dentist, lawyer, priest, rabbi, politician, congressman, senator. They'll, they'll really appreciate it. You know their name. You cared. You're loving, caring, concerned. But they still not very likely to say to you, oh, by the way, hey, you ran a half hour late and I think you're an egomaniac and uh, I'll come back, but you're an asshole. They, they, they won't say that, okay? They're a little bit... They're a little bit, so, society still has that little confrontational tolerance bearer. But when your assistant calls back a week later, she'll get the whole story. She'll say, Alan, remember me? This is uh, Alan, Dr. Franz, dental assistant. A week ago, he did two fillings. You've had a week to drive around the block. We just want to know if everything's okay. And they'll say things like, uh, well, Alan, uh, are my teeth supposed to touch on the other side? Uh, Am I supposed to get floss down the front? Uh, it packs food behind it. If I drink something cold, I pass out in a cold sweat. Uh, is that normal? Uh, there's pus leaking out of the side of my tooth. And if they have a complaint, they'll tell her. Because remember, on the phone, mom is 10 feet taller. She weighs 300 pounds. And say, by the way, I want to tell you something, Alan. I'm very upset because, you know, they told me it was going to be $70 and it ended up being $80 or whatever, whatever, whatever. And, and right there on the phone, we can end this problem. We can say, well, wait a minute. We didn't touch until we wrote down the price. We did on FA. You signed it. Let me get your chart. Let me see what happened. We can diffuse everything with these we care calls. Uh, and if you have a staff member or an associate or someone who just 
doesn't want to do this. My God, you got the wrong personality type for the service business. Now, cut your losses with that person when you can. Um, so how many minutes do I have? Well, let me just end on this. You know, the percentage of the U.S. population who makes dental visits within a year span, selected years, 1963 to 89, in 64, 42 out of 100 Americans um, went to the dentist. Uh, 69 is 45, 78 it was 50, 83 is 55, 86 was 57, 89 is 57.2. So we got from 42 to 57 out of 100 people are making a, popul um, a visit to the dentist now. Um, and it's coming along because of consumerism. Um, Consumer-oriented means focusing the purpose of your business towards those persons who consume your goods and services for their own needs, not your own needs. It's the same thing to do as convenient, easy to do, easy to use, easy to get used to, requiring little work, trouble, or effort. Um, consumerism is about simply availability, accessibility, extended hours, evenings, Saturdays, in-house panos, financing options, MasterCard, Visa, American Express, uh, same-day appointments. Remember, it's not just emergency scene that day. When they call and make an appointment, they say, well, Margaret, when did you want to come in? Remember, if I call a restaurant and want to make a reservation, the first thing you say is, well, when did you want to come in? Tonight at 6. Okay, tonight at 6. You call up Southwest Airlines, I'd like to buy a plane ticket to go to Disneyland. First thing I ask you is, well, when would you like to go? Only healthcare do you say, yeah, I'd like to make an appointment. And they say, I got a Thursday at 3 or Friday at 1. Uh, I'm sorry, are you, are you paying this? Are you paying for this? Or am I paying this with my own money for me? If I'm paying this with my own money for me, don't, aren't you even going to ask when I want to come in? That's how dysfunctional healthcare is. You go to practice management seminars and they say, oh, never do that. Because then everybody will take your evening hours and they'll all want Saturday. And, and what you want to do is you want to cram them in all the crappy hours. Don't listen to these people. They don't even have dental offices. Do beautiful cosmetic dentistry, in-office prescription of uh, non-narcotic drugs, uh, differentiate yourself with your FAGD, your MAGD, orthodontics, oral surgery, perio, pedo. Just, it's so easy. And do the McDonald's checklist. McDonald's has a signature build, building. Light uh, means that you know it's a McDonald's by looking at the building. They have lighted sign, name and logo, economic incentive coupons, television advertising, a realistic market attitude, train management, train staff, consistent product, their systems dependent, their founders dead, and they still get up every morning and do the same thing, and they have consumer convenient hours. And on that note, I just want to say it's been a fun day five, and uh, do it, action. Just do it, and I'll see you on day six. Thank you very much.